Hello, Tokyo family. Yes, I know it's been a while, it's been forever, but we're back with Moon Mission. Apologies, been busy running Tokyo Metrics. So many different things we've been working on, from building an AI based NFT grade that's coming soon. Stay tuned. Uh, and just adding lots of other functionality to the product. But I know the market's not been that good, but guess what? NFTs have still been doing well, specifically blue chip NFTs. I mean, you guys know uh, I was in on Board Apes. wasn't early, but I was in, and boy, has that paid off. We had the Mutant Apes airdrop. We had uh, the other deeds. I was able to claim two NFTs, one for my Mutant, one, one for my Board Ape, and then we had Murakami Flowers. Oh, man. So I want to do a deep dive and share with you the way I'm viewing the market now and where I think things are going to go. And as usual, not financial advice. But before we do that, let's take a back step to a, an old Moon Mission video where I talked about how the crypto market for the first time now was becoming different asset classes that were uncorrelated with each other. What does that mean? Because now we have basically crypto has been in a bear market because if you go to token metrics, let me actually pull up token metrics here. Uh, give me one sec. Okay, all right. So here we have token metrics and we're looking at Bitcoin. So if we look at the TM grade for Bitcoin, it has not been doing too well, right? Right now, it's basically under 30% on the daily. Daily is the most real-time TM grade to use. Weekly takes a, a week moving average. Monthly is a lot longer. But if you notice, we added this new functionality that shows you the TM grade and the price of Bitcoin over time to show you how accurate the TM grade is. Right? And look, if we go to the last three months, I mean, basically, Bitcoin has just been stagnant. And Bitcoin has not really been doing too well. Right? The only time was when it kind of went flat, but it's not been doing too well. Then same thing with Ethereum. Ethereum's TM grade is also very, very low. So we've technically been in a bear market. And if you call one of my last videos on Moon Mission, I mentioned that we were in a bear market. And that's evident by going to the technical analysis indicator. And basically, for Ethereum, we're in a bear market officially based on the low frequency trading models on December 5th. Then we had a, a mini rally, and then we've been in a bear market since April 21st on Ethereum. Meaning that now you, you can still make money in a bear market. However, your strategy shifts, it changes, you become more conservative. You look to diversify into other asset classes. Then same thing with Bitcoin. If we go to Bitcoin, go to the technical analysis indicators, Low frequency, we've been in a bear market again, or, or, or rather, it's been bearish since April 12th. What do you do? Well, I mean, for me, uh, I've been just delving more and more into NFTs, right? Um, to a point, a good portion of my portfolio now is in, is in NFTs, but specifically blue chip NFTs. Uh, when I joined NFT space last year, because I was kind of late to it, initially I wasn't really a believer, so I just kind of fumbled an A10 and became an NFT DJ. And in a way, it was a rite of passage. I had to do that to learn, but I lost a lot of money. I mean, real talk, if we go to my collection here, I'll tell you the ones I, I lost money on. Actually, let me sort this based on when I received them. Okay, so it looks like I hit some, some looks like I hit the bad ones, because sometimes you get uh, some spam. So ignore all the different spam here, but basically 95% of NFTs are, are garbage, right? And even the ones I do have, right? Like I bought a Void Ape, I bought Mooncats, this. I lost 18 or seven ETH on board money. I lost five ETH on party penguins. Uh, I minted the Secret Society. I got into Creature World at an ETH. And basically, I was just investing in, 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 any, in anything. And I did have a strategy. I was going based on where the FOMO was, based on trading volume, based on data on Nonsense and other on-chain products. But at the end of the day, they're all just quick flash in the pants. They had no staying power. The only NFTs that have really done well were my board ape. So if we can go back and figure out what made me want to invest in a board ape because I was late to the game. I, I got my board ape uh, pulling this up here 
I think in August or September. When did I buy it? I, I bought it for 62 ETH eight months ago. Yeah, August 24th. So for me, it was a fellow tokenometrics investor and friend of mine in Austin. Um, basically, these guys are big art, art collectors and they're known for collecting blue chip art. These guys have lots of bank seats, lots of like blue chip creme de la creme art pieces and they got into crypto and their customers are tokenometrics. And we hang out all, all the time in Austin. And for the first time, he explained to me why it made sense to invest in a board ape. And the way he explained it to me was, board apes basically are a blue chip NFT. And if you go to the art world, to understand investing in art, because art is very subjective. What makes you want to spend tens of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars on an art piece, is if, the, if one, is you think it's gonna hold its value, and two, you believe it will stand the test of time will be timeless. That's the definition of a blue chip art piece. So he applied that same concept to NFTs. And that's when my mind just kind of was wide open. I was now aware, I was now conscious, uh, kind of like near in the matrix, I took the red pill a day, right? But because I just recently began investing and dabbling in, in art and same thing, when I went to the, to the art gallery down in Austin, I would just tell them, hey, what a good, pieces to invest in. And they said, if you're an investor, look for blue chip pieces. And they defined a blue chip art piece as an art piece you can take anywhere in the world, whether North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, anywhere in South America, anywhere in the world. And everybody knows that artist's name and they value him. And, I, and their art pieces are timeless and they will have a market. They'll be liquid, right? So examples are, Picasso, you can take a Picasso here in New York, where, where I am right now, to Austin, to Hong Kong, to Cape Town, South Africa, to Sydney, Australia. Everybody knows a Picasso and anybody who has the money to and wants to buy it will buy it, right? Getting out of it is not an issue, right? Liquidity is not really an issue unless you have a high price, right? That's the definition of a, of a blue chip NFT. But I, I would like to simplify this even more when it comes to art. Think of a blue chip NFT as, oh, I'm sorry, not NFTs, a blue chip art as an art piece that has stood the test of time, has been voted on by peers and other people who are respectable, got on the stamp of approval, and has now gotten into the upper echelon of the best art galleries and the best art exhibitions. Meaning that it's worked its way up. It's not just an art piece off the street, right? So how do you apply this to NFTs? My perspective that I've shared in other videos is imagine an NFT museum 10 years down the road or even 30 years down the road. Think super long term. If you see how many NFTs enter the marketplace right now, what NFTs in 30 years would still be in an NFT museum? Because if NFTs are growing exponentially, 95% of them will not be in that art museum. And this comes to really a concept in branding and marketing, but specifically branding the first of a category. You want to be the first to do something. Everybody knows the first man on the moon. Nobody will really know the second person on the moon. Right? People will know the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. Nobody knows who was number two. Right? People forget number two because it's not, it's not novel anymore. Everybody knows the first person to run the four minute mile. Right? Nobody knows who was number two. So when it comes to NFTs, you look at who's innovating. And when you see somebody with breakaway innovation that reaches product market fit and then goes mainstream and they're the first to do something, that's blue chip, right? So one element of it is looking at trading volume on different platforms, right? But ones that states that have stood the test of time. So for me, what my investor friend told me was board apes were the first NFT collection to have a private membership group that was NFT gated like this ex exclusive club, think like Soho House, to go mainstream, right? They basically built this exclusive private club, right? The Yacht Club. And that's why it went mainstream. So that made me film one in and I'm glad I did because I got in for 62 ETH. At the time was, at the time it was 100, basically almost $200,000 is how much I bought or ate in for my board, Abe. 
And you would think I'm just buying a JPEG. But having recently invested in, in art at the time and understood how bullshit art was, was good for you, I applied that to NFTs and that's how I've got my best NFT investment. So now looking at the benefits of that, I got airdropped a mutant, or I claimed a mutant ape, and the floor for that is 25 ETH. 25 ETH at current prices is, if ETH is currently 2,700, so about slightly under $70,000 back on my investment for holding that mutant ape. And then if we go to the other lead sale, right, I got, I got a coda, right? So this is actually my, my other side, uh, NFT. And I already have an offer for this for 20 ETH. So we have 55K basically. All right, so let's say 67 plus uh, 55. So 122 ETH back on my investment for just hodling board apes. Then I also got the second uh, other deed. This has no coda. Uh, this is the, the deed I got. And this is, I have an offer on this for 23K. Right, so I've earned $145,000 back basically as an airdrop for just holding a board ape, right? And not to mention that the floor price has gone up as well, right? So the, the floor price for board ape, floor price is 110 ETH, right? So I bought it for 62 ETH. So I've made 100, basically 130K on my board ape plus 145. So I've made $275,000 through my board ape, right? in terms of profit since I bought it. And if you look at all the other NFTs, pretty much those that aren't blue chips, I've lost money on, which comes to this meme that's going around on Twitter, right? This ETH meme. Now this is Ethereum. Here are all the other 7,000 NFT collections all looking for a drop, all looking for money. But only the top 10 NFT collections, only the blue chips are making money. And this is really, I think, the, the best way to view NFTs. You either have to be in early and mint, or you have to find out which ones are going to be the next board apes or the next blue chips and get in. Uh, and our NFT hidden gem section, the newsletter covers this, right? We covered Moonbirds uh, when it launched for 2.5 ETH. And now Moonbirds is like, if we go to Flips Finance, looking at the rankings, right? Moonbirds has a floor now of 28 ETH, almost 30 ETH, right? So basically it's done a, a 10X. Over, over 10x return, almost, yeah. So I would say, then Azuki. So if we're looking at the next blue chips, looking at what, what we know now, in my definition, what would I say are blue chip NFTs, right? Looking at this, I would say one, looking at the top 10. So if we begin at the bottom, and then looking at those that have stood the test of time. Those have that have been, basically consistently in the top 10 since they launched for a long period of time for let's say six months i'll say three at least three months if not six months right once you see that that's a sign that this could be a blue chip nft and has long-term value right so out of the ones i see here the ones i've been keeping an eye on clone x especially those with the more common drifts but those are going for over 150 e because they're very rare traits azuki's uh, Moonbirds, Murakami Flower Seed, which, which I bought recently, uh, even though this is relatively new. Uh, Mutants, Bird Apes, and Doodles. Doodles, I believe that the expectation that there'll be a metaverse or they announce the metaverse. I think that might be why they're going up. And then other deeds. All right, so let's say you missed the Bird Apes. How, how could you get in if you don't have much money? Honestly, I would say the strategy is look at when new NFTs are launching that have a very low floor that are under 10 ETH, that are under 5 to 10 ETH, and use that as a sign into what to possibly get by, right? So let me just go through what I'm currently doing, right? So we covered my, the, the board apes, covered the mutants, the yacht club, other deeds. So this is actually my Norcomi flower that I bought. Uh, this has a 10. I bought this pre-reveal. I bought this on OpenSea. I got this actually for like about um, 9 ETH because the price was fluctuating uh, pre-reveal. 
but I wanted to make sure I had one, so I got this. Uh, right now, it's not doing too well, but to me, the fact is, I have two Murakami art pieces I bought in, in real life one year prior to him launching. It's basically last year, right? So when I heard he's doing an NFT collection, I basically fumbled it. But I knew this was going to be blue chip because this guy is a blue chip artist in the real art world, and he's now coming digital. And his NFTs on Clone X have already done very well, right? So him working with Artifact Studios, I think there's a lot of hype in this. I think there's a lot of potential in this as well. I think it's been somewhat disorganized in terms of how they're, they're executing this, but obviously it's the first time doing this, so I give them some leeway. But I mean, even even to a point where our own fund, uh, Token Matrix Ventures, has purchased some NFTs, right? So we purchased this for the fund. We purchased uh, basically five Murakamis. So we have one of this potato head uh, flower with the Super NES controller. We have the Pharaoh. But the way I'm looking at this is, if I'm going to get get into into a collection, I'm going to one try to get in via the mint. So I did try to get into via the lottery, had no success. Then there was a chance to buy some pre-reveal. I did that. I basically bought the floor. And then once it launched, I basically looked for the rare ones and I tried to buy those that, that were rare, right? And I, the tools I used, there are lots of different tools out there. And uh, the future will also have this on token metrics, but it's some good ones. Rarity Sniper, I think I've covered this in the past. They now have a very nice web UI. You can come here, look at the blue chip collections, basically the top selling collections, and the ones that are consistently here, you can come here and look at it, right? So, so for example, the Murakami Flowers, what I did is I came here, clicked on it, and it sourced the ranking for you. It has the NFT rankings for you, and you can come here and sort and put in what you want to buy, right? So let's say I want to buy one under 20 E. I put that in. I can choose the traits I want. But why I like this is you can come here and look at the traits, right? So there are 11 trait categories and it shows you the occurrences and which ones are rare, right? So the main thing to look at is to see what, what traits actually matter, right? So looking at this, let me show you my, my mindset. Obviously this is different for, for lots of other people, but the way I view this is looking at the traits here, I noticed that 72% had four traits and only four had seven traits. So it looks like the more traits you have, the rare that NFT is, right? Uh, so that's not something that I, to note down. If we come down to special traits, this thing almost 100% almost have no special traits. And there's seven NFTs out of the 10,000 plus NFTs the, and only there's only one of each. These are super rare, right? These are the thing I think are the ones with the, the humans. Then the eyes, the eyes have a very even distribution. So the eye trait is pretty much useless. Looking at this, the mouth, same thing. They're all pretty evenly distributed. So pretty much useless, ignore that. Mouthware, 81% have none. And then the, the rest have anywhere from 2% all the way down to close to 0%, with the small dog mouth being the most rare. So the mouth, mouth wear is very rare trait you get to have. When it comes to the mask, same thing. 94% have none, and the rest are very rare. Eyewear, same thing, about 80% are none. So as you can see here, you can find out which traits are very, very rare, and you know which ones to look out for. So costume, costume one is one that's pretty interesting. 50, 57 traits in this category, and they're all pretty much rare except for 95%. And then background, looking at this same thing, and right? except 88% are none and the rest are rare. So looking at this, you kind of get an idea of which traits to look out for, which ones to not look out for. Like tribe, tribe has 107 traits. And looking at this, they're all are pretty evenly distributed between 1.21% all the way close to 0.7%. So tribe is not really that useful. So this gives me the data points in terms of the on-chain data and the rarity of what matters, right? So you have this, uh, then you can go back here to the ranking. And now you look at the, at the visuals, 
right? So let's look at the visuals and see what is actually doing well. So now looking at the visuals, according to Rarity Sniper and their Rarity Ranking algorithm, these are the most rare. So we have this, right? This has, this seems to be very, very busy, right? Looking at this, it has the special, as you mentioned, that's very rare, the Steve. It has a very high trade count of six and it has the mouthware and all the other stuff, right? So it looks like visually, anything that's super busy seems to do very well, all right? Then we have these with the humans, the ones I talked about, the special as well, the, ma this is the Maho, uh, and the rest of the stuff is not really that rare, but I think just having the special makes it rare because this is one of, this is the most rare trait. And just visually looking at this, I think uh, Murakami Flowers did a pretty good job with this. I know people on Twitter have been roasting him, saying this is very simple. I think it's simple, but artistic, right? It's innovative or rather futuristic while staying nostalgic, right? Because the whole, if you go to his page, these are meant to be like, what's I think 70 or 80s Japanese TV show or video game characters. So if he's going to build a metaverse that's nostalgic, I think this, this makes a lot of sense, right? And I think this is pretty cool while being very simple. So looking at this, you kind of get an idea of what visually is good. And what I notice is basically backgrounds that have a lot of stuff going on or NFTs with lots of traits or a very, very simple NFT that has very few traits, right? Like a, like a, like a simple flower. And then um, if you actually go to Twitter, this is a poster that Takashi posted on Twitter and people are speculating that these are going to be the rare NFTs. And if you notice this, I love how artistic this is, right? The gradients, it goes from light green all the way to a warm orange, red, then to purple, then to blue, then it cools off. But also flowers, I think this is very artistic, right? Uh, so there'll be a museum exhibition in New York to be beginning next week from May 11th to June 25th. And there's speculation that why did he launch the NFTs one week prior to the exhibition. Maybe there'll be a huge announcement, right? Because we know he really has partnerships with Hublot, Louis Vuitton, and other big brands. Maybe something is coming for NFT holders. But in general, I think if you, if you look at these NFTs, right, if this is what the artist has chosen to feature, possibly in this and maybe other stuff, because uh, word is on Twitter, he has been buying his own art uh, on the blockchain, on, on OpenSea, right? Um, maybe this is what he values, then why does he value that, right? Because, for example, looking at all these different flowers, one thing I noticed is he's been valuing a lot of rainbows, right? So what I did is I went to Rarity Tools, or Sniper, and let's switch for rain rainbow, right? So I see, it looks like he likes visually rainbow eyes. That's a rare trait. Rainbow glasses, that's a rare trait. Rainbow costume. So one hypothesis is that anything with rainbow might do well visually, right? Because when it comes to NFTs, it's not always just purely about the rarity. It's also about the aesthetics, the look, the art, right? So trying to balance that is the the tough part. But looking at this, this kind of why I went and this kind of <laughs> aped in, but I, I was epping in, epping in with a strategy. Uh, you can also use other sites as well for confluence. So Gem also has their own, um, like if you come here to, Gem is a pretty good site, lets you buy uh, NFTs across OpenSea, uh, Luxray and other platforms all at once. You can buy them in bulk. Our user just is, is pretty good. They got purchased by OpenSea. So if we come here, one thing I like to do is look, comparing their Rarity on Gem versus Rarity Sniper Tools and then other different platforms. And then seeing which ones across different platforms have a consistently high rarity and then basically going with that. But I think if you're going to be investing in NFTs, uh, right, you have to see which ones are blue chip, right? I, I don't want to go on for too long, but that's the lesson I, I've learned from investing in NFTs. I'm not, I'm not really a trader, so I'm more of a value investor. And I think the best threshold is to mint projects that, or rather NFT, NFT collections that have a lot of community and FOMO 
from highly influential people, right? If you go through the list we've shared in a private group to our customers, uh, on the top NFT people to follow in the space, I think at this point it's over 150 people in the group, I mean, I, on that list. So if you see that a good portion of them follow a new project that hasn't minted yet, that's alpha right there. That means lots of people in the know are already watching this project, right? That's the first check for anything pre-mint. But getting on the whitelist is tough, whether it's a Dutch auction or a lottery, it's tough luck. But once that happens, then once it, once it mints and it's trading in OpenSea, look at the, at the trading volume. I would look to see if the trading volume is in the top 10, and I would just buy the floor initially. Uh, and then if it's consistently in the top 10, that's a good sign, right? So looking at the ones that have, that have been consistently in the top 10, as we covered, uh, Doodles, Board Apes, Mutants, Moonbirds, Azuki, and Clonex. Uh, me, bits possibly, but in terms of which ones I think have potential, the ones I'm thinking of buying next is probably Azuki. Um, more flower I bought. Now, this is very early on, but I just think the artist is so blue chip that it's going to be blue chip. And then looking, roadmaps don't really matter so much, but I think you have to look at the vision of the artist and see if there's potential for them to really innovate and ask yourself, what are they doing with this first? Right? So if, as I mentioned, Board Apes, they were the first private group, private culture in the NFT space to really go mainstream. Right? They've been featured in Rolling Stones and all that. So they've, they blew up the NFT space. That's why they've, they'll stand the test of time. And at this one, they've raised so much money that they aren't really going to go away anytime soon. So I think board apes are here to stay long term. Now, Azuki's, you could say they're the first really anime NFT collection to really go mainstream, right? They've done lots of different partnerships and they've, they've done their bin drop. They plan to build their own metaverse, is my understanding. So I would say from an anime perspective, they're the first in that category. Um, then when it comes to Moonbirds, they were the first private research alpha group, right? Kind of like token metrics, right? But except that they, they, they have no product yet. <laughs> um, and then more coming flowers. Why do I think this will stand the test of time and be blue chip in a museum 10 years down the road? This is the first big NFT collection from a contemporary artist who was already blue chip. Right? Basically, Murakami, Takashi Murakami was going to be in the Art Hall of Fame already. And now he's taking his entire life's work. And right? if you go through his, his uh, paper on, on the website, he plans to make that digital and sell both through NFTs. That's the first of a kind. Right? So I think the fact that he's the first doing this will be there in, in the NFT history museums. But anyway, that's kind of the way I'm looking at the market right now. Uh, because as you mentioned before, Bitcoin is bearish, Ethereum is bearish, but we're still making money in NFTs, but only blue chip NFTs, right? So I think that's really the alpha. And that's really what this Moonshin episode is about, is finding the alpha. Blue chip NFTs have been great to hold value in your portfolio. Right? If you don't have blue chip NFTs in your portfolio and you have garbage or trash, it is not good. If anything, almost all, all, all of that will go to zero. I mean, I've been trying to sell mine at full prices just to get out of them, to get into blue chip NFTs. At this point, I will not touch anything that is not blue chip or I don't think it will be blue chip, right? Because we're in a bear market, our strategy has to shift. So with that being said, uh, let me know what you think down in the comments below. What NFTs do you think will be blue chip? Uh, tell me down in the comments below. And as we like to say, the moon is not the limit to the moon and beyond. <laughs>